episode, the first episode ever of Contour Live. My name's Kat Boyd. And before introducing our guest tonight, let me just mention that Contour is entirely supported by word of mouth and your generosity. So please, if you can, take a second to help others find us by liking and subscribing to Contour on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Please also subscribe to Independence Live, a great bunch of folk who we are collaborating with on this project. Now you can watch the show live every week up until the election on Indie Live, YouTube and Facebook. And you can find us at contour.co.uk. If you're feeling extra generous, please back independent media by giving us a small monthly donation. You can tweet along with the live show tonight using the hashtag Contour Live. And if you'd like to pose a question to one of our guests, you can type it in the comments on the YouTube or Facebook live stream you're watching and I'll ask our guests about it on your behalf. Now, for some time, this year's Scottish election threatened to be the most predictable in living memory. For better or worse, the last few weeks have certainly livened up the debate. At the very last minute, the Alba party was launched, emerging from a split in the SNP over numerous issues, including the investigation into the mishandling of complaints against Alex Salmond. Now, there are serious ongoing questions over Salmond's suitability for office, and the launch of Alaba has been difficult, with accusations of racism against one candidate, while this week another courted controversy with offensive remarks about leading LGBT groups. Critics suggest that far from building a supermajority for independence, it's become divisive and distracting. And while the party has seen one promising poll, most show the party set to win zero seats. However, Alibaba's supporters still insist it can make a breakthrough and change the conversation about independence. Last week also saw the death of Prince Philip. Political campaigning was suspended into Monday and the mainstream reaction, unsurprisingly, has remained largely deferential. But Scottish Green Party leader Patrick Harvey did raise the topic of the Duke's extreme wealth and privilege. So are Republicans starting to emerge from the shadows in Scottish politics? And if Scotland becomes independent, do we really need the monarchy? Of course, these constitutional questions have threatened to diminish the importance of various party manifesto launches. Scotland still has the highest rate of drug deaths in Europe and has made only limited progress on promises to reduce poverty and the attainment gap in schools. Has independence itself become a distraction from Scotland's domestic difficulties, especially after the pandemic? And will the next parliamentary term see new radicalism on the policy front or more of the same? Joining me tonight to make sense of it all is firstly, Leslie Ruddock. Leslie is a broadcaster, commentator, and author of Blossom, What Scotland Needs to Flourish. I'm also joined by George Kerevin, an economist, journalist, and long-standing SNP intellectual who recently defected to the Alba party. We're also joined by Kieran O'Neill, the Scottish Labour candidate for Mary Hill, and Maggie Chapman, a long-standing socialist leader in the independence movement who's top of the Scottish Green list for North East Scotland. So welcome to you all. We'll just get right into it then. So with Prince Philip's death last week, all of the main parties in Scotland announced that they would suspend campaigning as a mark of respect for the man. But is it right for political campaigning to stop less than four weeks before the election what does that say about our democracy? Leslie, what are your thoughts? I was absolutely staggered um, <clears throat> at the, the speed with which every political party seemed to just agree to suspend, you know, business as usual. Totally staggered. And I mean, I, I worked from a since uh, in the BBC for 25 years. And there are, there are <laughs> I mean, there are whole departments devoted to um, what happens when when the Queen or any of the significant members of the royal family die. And uh, I mean, I remember all the protocols that you had to at least be aware where to find them in a hurry. Um, 
there was all sorts of arrangements made. But the thing is, they've been sitting on the stocks. That was how, how long is it since I left the BBC? I can't even remember, 10, 15 years. So possibly those things have been drafted 25 years earlier. They've probably been sitting there for 40 years. I mean, the Queen and Prince Philip are the longest lasting, you know, living um, monarchs probably, perhaps in the world. They've had the longest joint reign. So I think an awful lot of the arrangements that were made were made back in a really crusty BBC announcer sort of day. Um, the, the succession of, of, of kind of t people that trooped out onto BBC programmes with black jackets on, you know, guys, especially noticeable on things like the BBC Scotland channel, where, you know, programmes like the Nine are pretty d doing with the kids normally with just kind of guys in denims and normal shirts. And suddenly everybody was there as if, well, like it was a funeral for their personal family. And um, I just think it just exposed in a second how we've changed, how that's not, just doesn't feel right at all. And the, the record number of complaints that the BBC has got, I think, suggests that, you know, I wasn't alone. And OK, there's no need to be particularly unpleasant um, in, in, in the immediate death of, of anybody. Um, and clearly, for some people, they were very close to him. We can find humanity and compassion, I think, for anybody who's who's been bereaved. But you just have to look at, I mean, if, if Prince Philip was anything, he didn't really kind of, you know, stand on a lot of kind of empty ceremony. He didn't seem to have much time for that, as well as many other things he didn't have time for that perhaps wounded more of us. But... Um, he didn't have time for this kind of empty ceremony, and yet it was it was lavished on him. And there was one column in particular that that I thought really had it spot on, uh, which was written by Kevin McKenna. And there was just one phrase from it that I thought was brilliant. One sentence he said, um, "This is the establishment have made golden calves of dysfunctional German um, family. Uh, it's not through ger genuine admiration." Um, but because their existence sanctifies and re reinforces a class system that underpins English society. And that's it. It was used. He, his death was used. So I, I just basically had a really cheery holiday from all television because you couldn't go on to anything without getting overwhelmed with meaningless, insincere nonsense. And, and actually then went out for a massive walk where I found all the other refuseniks from around the place also out at a local community centre, bemoaning the fact that they couldn't actually watch or listen to anything. So I think big own goal from the establishment's point of view over... Yeah, over I mean, primetime viewing figures for both the BBC and ITV plummeted on Friday night. I mean, G George, what's your thoughts on this? Um, have the government and broadcasters really misjudged the public mood? I was, I was actually heartened by the number of complaints the BBC got, because it suggested that there is a new generation who they may not be ardent Republicans, uh, certainly don't accept all the, the flummery and, and the obsequiousness uh, that the establishment is trying to stuff down their throat. Um, I was more shocked, in fact, by the number of politicians who didn't catch the mood, the new mood, and went on in the old fashion of, of making, you know, all, all the statements we had in Parliament and in the Scottish Parliament about how wonderful Phil was. You know, I don't wish ill to the man and he, he had a, a ripe age and, and his family will be very upset and be grieving. No one wants to, you know, laugh at that. Um, but there was no need from a lot of politicians to be quite so over the top uh, in their tributes. And it suggests to me that they were being um, uh, less than honest with public. They were going mm. through the motions. It was very dishonest. Mm. And I'll, well, I'll, that's, I'll, that's I'll, interesting. I'll just... You should please finish. No, I'm just going to say, well, well done, Patrick Harvey and the Scottish Parliament, who managed to make a very um, sensible and, and uh, uh, speech that was, you know, the, the, the caught the mood. But he was still managed to get across that actually most of us in Scotland. Um, uh, do not buy into the kind of moniker that we've got. 
Well, I think I think it's interesting that you say that, George, and I'm sure that um, plenty of our viewers would would agree with that. But Kieran, let me come to you. Um, do you think on this question of having to grovel to the to the monarchy? I mean, did, did Jeremy Corbyn not have to learn the hard way that the way to get ahead, the only way to get ahead in UK politics is that you have to, in fact, show some degree of deference? Well, I think I think if if the UK was a republic, I think the same deference would have to be shown to a, a democratic elected head of state. Now, I mean, the monarchy as an institution is one that um, a great deal many people derive comfort and certainty from. Um, I, I'm not one of those people, um, and I think a lot of, a lot of people fall into that category. I think you know, as has already been said, you know, on a personal level, you know, I, I, it's hard to to not feel empathy with a family that's more than the loss of, you know, a, a dad, a granddad, you know, somebody's partner over 70 years. Um, but I do think, you know, the response, I, I also think particularly during the pandemic when so many, particularly older people, you know, um, you know, the television has been such an important part of our lives, you know, and staying in connect, staying connected. The fact that, um, you know, everything had to put on pause because somebody died, you know, of course that's an incredible tragedy, but, you know, over 150,000 people across these islands have lost their lives over the last few years, um, over the last year, sorry, in this pandemic. And, you know, that's an incre every single one of those is an incredible tragedy. So I think, I think there is, there is a, there is a juxtaposition there that, that nobody's quite answered. Um, but obviously, you know, at the end of the day, um, there is a protocol that has to be followed, and I'm, you know, I'm not surprised that Leslie said there's whole departments dedicated to this. Um, but you know, I just think uh, it shows that you know, is, is this an institution that, you know, is it still, you know, in the in the the halcyon days it was, or is it time to have a rethink of that? I mean, yeah. So Maggie. I mean, the question that we've got coming in from an audience member, Michael Doyle, um, he's asking, surely an independent Scotland would have to be a republic since the monarchy is the bedrock of the British state and constitution. Now, as George has already mentioned, Patrick Harvey's comments in Parliament. Um, what are your thoughts? Do you think that our institutions overall in Scotland are still too deferential to the monarchy? I mean, I, I, I share much of what Leslie and, and George have, have said around just the, the total misjudging of, of the mood that that the BBC got. I think there 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 is there is a, a, it shows deference to a, a, an archaic system that is not about democracy. It's not about the kind of future Scotland that we want to see, and it's certainly not a, a, about the kind of Scotland where we want to see a, a reinvigorated democracy. And in, in answer to to the question we got got from a viewer, absolutely. I, I'm a Republican. I'm a I'm a child of 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 the of post colonial era, having been born in Zimbabwe just before its independence, and I, I think there's something there's something quite striking about a country that gives so much to an unelected family that has you know huge huge disproportionate wealth and doesn't actually serve. The, the communities and, and the people of, of Scotland in, in the way that, you know, we would want our political systems and our political structures to serve. I, th I think it's, it's, it's note, noteworthy that it was, it's almost a year to the day um, over the weekend since uh, the Queen's attempt to get us to ignore politics and pull together it, as, as COVID uh, un unraveled in, in the UK, while her government was debating whether to lock down or to le let the virus rip through the population, they were indulging in a, in a festival of COVID cronyism. And I think that that just shows just how out of date, how arcane the, the, the monarchy is. Mm -hmm. It is not an institution of Scotland's future. And I, I think we, desperately need to avoid the attempts to depoliticize politics and you know the, the idea that we can gather around a flag while the Tories carry on with their asset stripping of, of our country. I think the, the, the huge political questions we need to be asking ourselves and you know Leslie made the point how, how, how on earth did, did we cancel campaigning? How, how did we cancel democracy? And yet something like the Grand National is, is fine to go ahead. That, that speaks to a very worrying mm. approach to politics within, within, our, within the UK and, and a worrying approach to the value of democracy. And I think, mm. you know, elections really should matter much more than in a horse race, mm. for instance, and shouldn't be, shouldn't be put up against, against things in, in, in that way. 
We've got another question from um, from a viewer, um, Andrew Rossiter. I'm going to I'm going to go to you, George, on this one. Um, Andrew's a bit mystified as to why the SNP are so differential to the British monarchy. Now you've been a SNP member uh, through through lots. Um, so what might be some of the, the reasons for that, in your view? Well, I, I took part in the last conference, SNP conference debate on the monarchy which I think was 97, 1997, 1998. And uh, Rosanna Cunningham had put up a motion uh, to support republicanism, and that was just defeated in favour of, of an amendment, I think, that said there would be a referendum on the monarchy and the head of state immediately post-independence. And I don't remember that position ever having been changed. Uh, I, I, you know, as Salmon's view was always that you know you to get to the referendum you had to um, uh, win as many people over as possible, which is why he 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 didn't want to be um, uh, uh, identified as a, as as a, as a Republican. Um, but the mood has changed. We have moved on, and I think as we I think as everyone is. I mean, I, I suspect everyone here is a Republican, and I think that is now the mainstream. Well, let's let's hope you're right because I think we are all Republicans here. Um, now, I want to just move this on to um, probably the biggest um, issue around this election. Um, on on, I mean, is it an independence election? So, I mean, Leslie, you're often I don't know if you know this, but you are often seen as the unofficial spokesperson uh, for the independence movement. Um, you know, and the, the mood music, I think, from the, the SNP on independence is as ambiguous as ever. The campaign's really focused on Nicola Sturgeon's leadership and recovery from the, the pandemic. So independence is, is kind of feeling like an afterthought for a lot of people. What's your view? Do you think this is an independence election? I did actually write a column to just, whoops, just this effect. Um it's not an independence election. I, I mean, it, there's the same difference between independence, the destination, and what we're doing now, which is discussing all the ways to get there, as there is between casting your vote in a polling station and discussing the route to the school. I mean, what we're doing at the moment is spending, as we did the last time, spending inordinate amounts of time on process and section 30s and how we'll get there and yada yada. And, you know, I'm not saying that's all not important, but, you know, most people, I think, work on the basis that they're willing to put up with difficulty, uncertainty, difficult processes. I mean, the way you assess whether or not you need to go in a rush, you need to be, you know, can, can, canny, all of those things tend to be determined by having a good feel for what this thing at the end of the road is going to do for you. And to me, an independence election would be doing what what did happen a, a little bit in yesterday's STV debate, it would be beginning to sort of like get the machinery out here. I mean, what what would, if we had independence, we could do a basic income. Without independence, we can't because we can't control, um, we can't control benefits and we can't control taxation. And it, it baffled me that in the first debate, uh, we had nobody who would clarify these actual factual errors that were flying around we need far more of these. I mean, again, I was delighted to see Patrick, especially in that last debate, um, and Lauren as well, uh, just move straight into what you could do on the energy and green front if you had more, if you had the full powers of a state. From the small things like being represented and actually running COP26 instead of being actually outside the door, uh, to setting a whole new energy system up, which would actually reproduce the example of Norway which used its hydro revolution essentially to transform the society that became independent in 1905. So it absolutely maddens me how boring also this debate becomes a lot of the time because we're not discussing independence, neither side is. And it actually suits everybody, including the broadcasters, not to kind of get into the discussion of what independence would look like. All I'm praying that somebody does, and they won't, is just have one debate, which is uh, a green recovery from COVID, independence or the union, discuss. And that's it. None of the rest of it, just that. Because actually, that's the discussion all of us are having to have ourselves, mm. unaided by any of the people who are paid 
to be facilitating this debate? Well, I think all of those things you've mentioned, Leslie, are contributing to a uh a real feeling of demoralization in politics. I think a lot of people who were involved in the independence movement in 2014 are feeling demoralized. Will uh, will another SNP government really be able to inspire the independence movement once more? I wouldn't have thought so. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many SNP governments have inspired the movement, to be honest, for kind of a wee while. I think we're a a bunch of self-starters, if ever there was that. Um, So we just kind of almost it's a bit like having your elderly aunts and uncles around, you know, that they're there. Um, They may be going at different speed, but they get the jokes eventually and it's fine. And they were there before you and there's respect. But inspiration, not sure that's where that you would look to for that source. And that's a shame, perhaps. But, you know, we've not we've not got more than our own experience of this in life. Governments um, are not generally terribly inspiring especially not British governments, and Scotland is still part of these islands. So I would never really be looking for my inspiration to political parties, which is why I've never joined one. Um, It it would be a different thing. I mean, we need to get the show on the road. We need to have a strategy. We need to have Nicola Sturgeon discuss it, air it, talk to other people about it, quit the lofty stuff and and, and begin begin to move. I don't mind if the rest of it is relatively uninspiring, There just has to be movement on that now. Thanks, Leslie. Um, So, George, the SNP did actually commit to a referendum this year, but that slipped to 2022 and then 2023 and now potentially afterwards. Do you think that this has slipped so far down the agenda that it's now off the agenda for the next government? I do. I mean, the, the First Minister has been promising a referendum every year. She promises one last year. She promises one this year. In fact, Ian Blackford was talking about October. There's not going to be a referendum this year. And I can't see anything within the uh, politics of the SNP at the moment that's going to get us a referendum or any move towards independence uh, this side of the next Hollywood election. Mm. And you can't go on promising referendums that never happen and getting re-elected. And my worry is we are repeating the 2016 referendum uh, uh, election. Uh, We'll end up almost certainly with an SNP uh, majority, largest party, uh, and then we'll drift on for another five years. Something has to happen Mm. to break the deadlock. Mm. I mean, I don't think that there is anyone who really doubts that the SNP will probably be the biggest party after May the 6th. But isn't this a government that's arguably done very little for the the last term of government? It's got certainly very few real achievements to its name in terms of uh, policy. We have the drugs death crisis, an incredibly slow response to that crisis in education. Kieran, do you think that the SNP would be getting re-elected if not for the independence question? Well, I think that's I think that's a complicated issue. I, I don't think the SNP would be getting re-elected if, for example, Boris Johnson was a prime minister. I do think you know, as long as uh, Bojo's there, the SNP have a golden goose and can you know fer- ferment uh, a politics that that doesn't really serve anyone. So, I mean, you mentioned the SNP's record. You know, well, what have they done in the last five years? I think the record has been one of failing the people of Scotland. You know, the drug deaths, um, a horrendous human tragedy. And I think the first minister said last night she took her eye off the ball. Um, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Um, and the sort of willful. Uh, the the willful sort of ignorance when it comes to that crisis. Indeed, many of the other pol- the litany of policy failures is unacceptable. And you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm not under any illusions on the issue of independence. I'm I'm the minority on on this panel. Even though I did vote yes in 2014, I have been on a different political journey. Um, I do believe that more can be achieved through political reform of the different institutions of these islands. I know I'm in a minority. I'm not denying that. But I do think this sort of binary where we're in, where it is. Boris Johnson's Britain or, um, you know, a sort of uh, growth commission Scotland just isn't doing anyone any good. Um, and I think I think there has to be a realisation and a reconciliation that there is a better way of doing things. Again, I realise I'm in a minority, but that's what I believe and that's what I think is best for Scotland. 
I mean, I think I agree that, you know, Boris Johnson can be a bit of a bogeyman, but the alternative at Westminster is, of course, Keir Starmer. Um, he was supposed to be a unity candidate. He removed Rebecca Long-Bailey from the shadow cabinet and suspended the, the former leader, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, has, has Keir Starmer really been the, the leader that you hoped for? Well, I, I didn't vote for Keir. Um, he is my leader. He obviously won a resounding mandate across all sections of the party. And I'd like to see him use it. You know, he made 10 uh, very good pledges. Um, I'd like to see him talk about that more. And at the end of the day, as I've said several times in uh, different, you know, Keir has to recognise that the 2024 election, Labour has to win it. Um, or the UK as an institution will, will probably not exist. And that's why Labour has to get out with a clear programme of reform. You know, obviously we've got this constitutional commission. Uh, I'm not in favour of the status quo. Very few people in the Labour Party are, but at the end of the day, uh, the UK leadership need to recognise that and uh, wake up and smell the coffee. Thanks, Kieran. Um, Maggie, we've got a question in here from Sarah Collins. Um, she wants to know, um, do you believe, still believe, that another Scotland is possible and what might that Scotland look like? Great question and, and thank you, Sarah. Absolutely, another Scotland is possible and I think Another Scotland is actually inevitable, and I think a better Scotland is possible. And hopefully, you know, following what happens in May's election, a better Scotland will be inevitable. It's very, very clear the Scottish Greens' position on on independence is supportive. We we want to campaign for independence. We we want to uh, we want a very, very clear decision on, on on and a referendum in the next parliamentary term. But our support for independence isn't just on sovereign terms or for in the sake of independence. We want independence for a reason, and that is to make Scotland a better place and for Scotland to take its place on the world stage and assist in making the world a better place. Independence for us is very, very clearly a means to a better end. It is not an end in itself. And I think, you know, it, it's very clear to us that we desperately need independence if we are truly to have the green industrial uh, revolution that we need to see. We can do some of it now with the powers we have, but we cannot do it all. We cannot do real wealth redistribution in, in Scotland when Scotland is still shackled to the psychodrama that is the Westminster government. We, we With an independent Scotland, we could uh, abolish the monarchy and, and say we want to elect our head of state and, and to take our place on the democratic world stage. We, we could uh, that independent Scotland could could be a state focused on social justice, having social justice at the heart of of, of its government and at the heart of, of a, a very different kind of democracy, a mm. radical democracy that sees power devolved not just from Westminster to Edinburgh, but from Edinburgh to, to communities across across Scotland. And, mm. you know, I, I, I don't need to, 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 to speak on this. Leslie is, is much more expert on, on this issue, but we, we desperately need a democratic revolution in Scotland that puts power back into the hands of of the people, not into the hands of, of a wealthy elite, not into the hands even of a political elite. Mm. We need radical decentralization of power in Scotland, but, and we can, we know we cannot do that mm. whilst we are shackled to the British mm. state. So, so yes, another, another Scotland is, I would say, inevitable, and we will be, the Greens will be campaigning very, very hard to make sure that that inevitable other Scotland is a much better, much fairer and much greener Scotland that sees the, the, the very, very clear connection between economic and social justice and also environmental justice, because we need that we need that uh, sort of environmental justice element of that if we are to have a sustainable future. Thanks, Maggie. And I certainly agree with you about the, the decentralisation of, of power. I know that the, the Greens have um, the a position on the European Union and we have a we have a question coming from Marty Smith here he says he's got concerns about the the current vision of pro indie parties in the election to tie independence to membership of the European Union now, do you do you believe that there should be a referendum on the EU post independence Maggie sorry so, sorry sorry I had had a, a, a mute button issue there um <laughs> Yeah, and and I I know you know that there have been discussions about whether independence 
whether an independent Scotland as part of the EU can actually deliver the kind of change we, we need to see. Scottish Greens very, very clearly want Scotland to be part of the EU because we see building alliances at that level to be really, really important. We know that we can't deal with the challenges that face our society as, as individual and isolated, isolated states. And we know that EU membership has enriched Scotland's li life culturally, economically, and socially over, over, over the years that, that we have we we were we were a member. So yes, we want to see Scotland back in the European Union because of the advantages and the benefits it gives us. It doesn't mean to say that we want the European Union to to stay unchanged. Far from it. You know, I never want to see the the the, the actions of the Troika. Um, being repeated as they were to to demonise Greece and, and you know the, the the actions of of elements of the European Union that that backed the police going out to batter people on the Spanish streets, mm -hmm. we should be standing up against that kind of oppression and violence where wherever we can. Mm. Thanks, thanks, Maggie. Now, George, I want to to come to you because this election has seen the introduction of another pro independence party, Alba, and it the launch of Alba and the first uh, few weeks seem to have been pretty chaotic and marked with quite a lot of controversy. Um, at the the launch, Alba has been presented as achieving a, a super majority for independence. So why are some candidates seeming to make it a priority to go to war with LGBT organisations? How can we? How can Alba claim a supermajority um, when when candidates are taking this kind of homophobic approach? Well, the supermajority issue is the only game in town when it comes to this election and transforming this election into a pro-indie election. So that is where I'm starting from. And it was only Alba's intervention into the election uh, around the question of a supermajority uh, that's actually um, transformed what was going to be a very boring debate into something that may marginally be able to help uh, get us towards independence. Now, from that perspective, you are perfectly correct, uh, uh, Kat, um, that there are lots of other issues which are emerging, which are uh, a deviation uh, from that central issue. Now, I want to make it very plain, ALBA is not anti-trans. Uh, uh, we have written into our, our constitution support for uh, trans rights, and I personally am in favour of uh, reforming the, uh, the GRA. Um, but you know, the, the debate on, on trans issues has become very toxic, and it's even led to, for instance, Andy Whiteman um, having to leave the Green Party. So it's not something that's just an ALBA issue. Uh, I do think that somewhere within Scottish politics, it's possible to discuss how we advance trans rights but still protect uh, the rights uh, of, uh, of, uh, of women. Um, and if we can't do that, then we can't have any politics at all. So let's all calm down and concentrate on political issues. That's my message. Thanks, George. Well, one of the, the leading defectors from the SNP to Alaba, um, the former councillor Austin Sheridan, um, has resigned from the party already over the refusal to condemn these remarks. Do you think others will have to join him? Um, on, on the particular show, you, I can only speak for myself. Myself is I, I, I thought that the, 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 the way that the, um, the debate was being uh, Push in the direction of the, you know, that the, there are um, elements of the uh, of the uh, of the LBG, LBGT community who want to reduce um, uh, uh, the age at which you're going to have sex to ten. I, I mean, that's you know, uh, uh, that is a nonsense. Um, but I, I, you know, when I, I, re I repeat, the debate over trans rights has become toxic, and it's right across the political spectrum. Uh, and has been for a number of years. And we all need to just calm down and see if we can find a space. And this is where I support uh, Andy Whiteman. It is possible to have a dialogue without each side um, denouncing the other. But, but George, an opportunity at the weekend for the leadership of your party to come out and denounce the homophobic and transphobic tr tropes that were coming out of, of, of from, from Alba supporters and Alba candidates. And we have had deafening silence. 
That's not good enough. That's not good enough. Well, for can the I come in on this as well, please, Kat? So if you personalize it like that, I mean, you, I'm, you've heard my position, right? You're, you're, we, we, and, 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 and you, I mean, the, I, I reiterate, I reiterate, you threw, Andy Whiteman was forced out of the Greens, one of the leading leftists, a, a beautiful, lovely man who wouldn't harm a fly, who couldn't possibly say he was anti-trans. So this is an issue which is, this is a divide that's happening everywhere. And it's happening because we are trying to blame individuals rather than Relaxing, let's discuss politics and issues. George, and I'm just going to pause. And nobody, Albert is in, is it, is it, is it anti Trumps? That's not the issue. Um, I'm going to bring Kieran in because he's been waiting um, to, to come in on this matter. Kieran, I think you're still muted. Sorry about that. Um, I, I mean, there's, so there's two issues. This first thing, George, um, the Scottish Parliament or democracy isn't a game. Uh, and I know you said, you know, the, the, you know, this, this is, this is a really, really important election about the future of Scotland. Um, the election system is not there to be gained. And frankly, I, you know, I appreciate that, you know, you've, you've been on a political journey a bit like me. Um, but to say that, you know, somehow saying that, you know, uh, LGBT youth Scotland Stonewall, you know, I'm an LGBT man myself. These organisations have quite literally saved the lives of my friends at some of the darkest times in life. To come out and say that those organisations are in favour of paedophilia is vile. If this was a Tory candidate, we would be calling for their head. So, I, you know, I appreciate you aren't responsible for this person, no, but I'm responsible for people in my part of the representative views. But how do you think this person, this person that's came out and said this, who hasn't apologised, is fit to serve in our national parliament? Well, Kieran, I just want to pick up on something that, that you said there, which is this, um, this idea of um, ALBA gaming the system, um, because the ALBA have called for a first vote for the SNP and um, for, for people to vote for ALBA second. Um, so many have said that ALBA threatened the legitimacy of pro-independence parliamentary representation by kind of gaming the system. But is that really is that really a fair representation of our democracy? I mean, Maggie, there's lots of people who vote for the Greens with, with their second vote. And I know that there are only a handful of Green candidates who stand on the first part of the ballot paper. Is it really fair to say that, that that type of call is gaming the system? Is that a question to me, Kat? Sorry. I, yeah. I, I, think, I, I think, you know, it, it's, not, it, it's not gaming the system if, if you actually stand candidates and win seats. Scottish Greens have been in the Scottish Parliament since its inception in 1999. We have delivered phenomenal changes for Scotland for, for people ac across the country for, from lowering tax for for the middle and, and lower income earners, you know, fr free free buses for under 22s, uh, free free bus transport for under 22s coming coming later th this year. You know, Scottish Greens get into the parliament and we make changes, we get things done. And I think the idea that you need uh, um, George's party to, to come along for, for this the so-called super majority is just nonsense. We have an independence majority in the Scottish Parliament. Well, we, we've, we've had it for the last parliamentary term. I believe we will have it again. And the Greens are in, in that position because we, we, want, we want to make Scotland better. We, we want to transform our country to make it a fairer, greener and more prosperous country for everyone in Scotland. Thanks, Maggie. I'm going to bring in Leslie here. Um, Leslie, I, I would be particularly interested to know your views on the, the supermajority idea. We had another question from an audience member flashing up earlier, um, someone who said that they wanted to vote in the election to further the independence agenda um, and asking the panel if, if they had any suggestions. Now, I know that um, obviously our candidates are going to do their own sell. Um, but, but Leslie, what's your thoughts on the, on the supermajority? Well, I think that the to, to sort of try and answer the question also that you asked Maggie, which was the Greens obviously stand on the list. Are they not gaming the system? I think the point is that they're a very distinctive party. That's my, my grumble with the whole thing about trying to create a party on what George would suggest is only all the, that, that really interests and motivates you, George, is the supermajority. Well, that's a strategic point. Um, what the Greens ha have been in for, for a very long time has been a completely different vision of society, which I think everybody can kind of understand. You know, So that's what, to me, a political party is. When you try to do something short of that, you run into all the sorts of problems that are now happening. 
to be able to try to create a distinctive party, some differences are having to be hyper um, puffed up, if you like, or focused upon. And the, the only main difference that there is, is this stance on women or gender rights. So whether you like it or not, um, that will end up being, being looked at. Um, there's also, I mean, Andy has been a very good friend of mine for probably 40 years. We, we were involved in the Isle of Egg buyout many, many years ago and so on. And um, I know a lot of the trouble that uh, he, he experienced within the Greens. But what he's chosen to do since he's left, as far as I can see, is not talk about it. <laughs> um, that's a choice of his. That's not to say that, that he didn't feel hurt and that other people on his behalf weren't fairly aghast. But he's choosing at the moment to set himself up as an independent candidate looking at a revolution for the Highlands, looking at land reform, at repopulating the Highlands and uh, clearing up the appalling housing situation for young people. So that's a choice he's made not to define himself by any stance regarding trans or not trans issues. And I think the problem for Alaba is that it's become very defined because it lacks any other distinguishing characteristics yet by something that most of you don't seem to want to discuss. And you're going to have to come out with some a bigger, better bunch of policies that it really looks like you believe in and haven't just grafted on a little bit gratuitously before people believe there's a real big, organic, animated, live party in there. Yeah, George, I'm going to, going to bring you back in um, to, to respond to, to some of that. Um, but also, I mean, what would Alba's domestic priorities be um, if elected? Is it, is it just about the supermajority or is there more? Oh, uh, the, there is more, but the, the, the defining feature of ALBA, it's a basically split from the SNP, uh, over 4,000 people, many of them local leadership of the SNP, who, are a, who want a plan B, who think that actually all the SNP government is going to do is wait for Boris Johnson giving a Section 30, which is never going to happen. And therefore, the, the, what we want to do is to use a supermajority as a launch pad for a range of campaigns, including uh, uh, mass action on the streets, uh, to force action from Westminster rather than just, you know, go cap in hand. So it's a fundamental split on the nature of tactics and not just waiting for uh, a, a, a Section 30 on, on other policies. Because um, uh, I know I've written the economic policy, um, uh, we would uh, launch a, an emergency uh, house building program. Now, other parties are in favour of that. We could have common ground, um, but it, the question is how fast to move on that if you want to um, uh, reboot the economy post COVID, uh, and we want to increase house building uh, by at least fifty percent on current form, which requires a major intervention. Uh, by Scottish government in terms of seizing control of land and removing bottlenecks and skills and so on. Uh, otherwise, the economy will just drift for the next decade. Thank, thanks, George. And we are uh, coming to, to the end of the programme now. Um, it's a shame because we've got more audience questions coming in, but we're nearly at the 45 minute mark. Um, and I know that that's been quite a lot of ground that we've covered today. So I just want to bring it to, to a close and thank you all very much for joining us as guests and thank you to our audience for for tuning in and you can tune in every week and um, to interact and hear us ask the questions that um, no one else dares or probably wants to ask and um, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank independence live for their technical support because without them this wouldn't have been possible you can stay in touch with us by subscribing to their YouTube channel or checking out their website, independencelive.net. I really want to thank the, the guests for being part of the discussion tonight and for taking a gamble and coming on our very first live episode. You can find Maggie and Kieran's election campaigns online by searching for them on Facebook or by following them at their Twitter handles, which have been going around the bottom of the screen. Leslie and George are regular contributors across the Scottish media, and you can also follow them on Twitter too. Finally, I'm sure everyone will join me, hopefully, in thanking Contour for organising this event. Now, remember, Contour tries to bring you the best debate and analysis ad-free 
without any millionaire backers. So if you can afford it, please support our work with a monthly donation. You can do that and view a lot more of our content at contour.co.uk. You can follow us at Contour Scott and you can keep in touch with our podcast, Contourcast, by searching Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud or iTunes. Thank you, everyone, and see you next week.